of the seminar. And today, Professor Santosh Kumar will deliver his lecture. Uh, thank you very much, the organizers of this uh, seminar. Uh, um, I am grateful to have this opportunity to speak something on uh, development. Actually, development, we primarily think it is a matter of economics. But nowadays, it has crossed all limits and it has become interdisciplinary. And uh, from my perspective, as a man of philosophy, uh, I have very little to add to this discourse. Still, uh, I have jotted down some points. I have jotted down some points. But Some criteria so that you can understand what is uh, 
uh, practical philosophy or applied philosophy. And applied philosophy or practical philosophy is for all, not uh, some particular path. Uh, as a demand, we confine with the notions of capability, dignity, and sustainability as involved here. On it, uh, there are so many dimensions. Uh, I shall not be speaking all these aspects. Before that, I will uh, say only two things about uh, the moral compass. Uh, actually, when we <coughs> jump uh, some activities, some actions, uh, there are mainly two points of view. One is called consequentialism, another is beyond the watch. And consequentialism means that an action is good or acceptable or right uh, if it uh, bears, if it uh, yields more uh, actually results that is uh, consequences are uh, good and for that respect. It is, it is just only on, the, only on the basis of consequences. And these consequences also have to be uh, 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 clarified what that consequence means. But on the whole we can say that what results it gives, that is the main point of uh, judging some action. And that is another point that is called deontology. It means that uh, there are some things which are, uh, which, which are our duty and that duty should be performed. Whether it is its consequences and uh, may be good for us or may not. But we have, we have to take that risk and perform those duties. These are the two main points of view uh, in moral philosophy uh, the, through which we can judge our activities. Another aspect, and it is also philosophical. 
very important. Uh, and there are different generations of development, which has been spoken by uh, different theory, uh, theoreticians. I shall not uh, uh, give time on that. The first generation of development began with economists with a great vision, and they gave, give us big theories and general strategies, which we can call economic process. The second generation of, uh, was almost ethicists, supporting realism grounded on the basic principles of neoclassical economics. And uh, third generation, we call, uh, which has enlarged with the embrace of multidisciplinary, exemplified by Omar Hossein, Omid Shahduri, Martha Musmo, and others, inviting the compass of development beyond institute economics. And fourth, it, it incorporates some parameters like human freedom, agency, capabilities, and functions in a world dignity. Uh, so that we can lead a meaningful life based on our values and choices. Uh, can I philosophy question ask the book again? I'm not any philosophy is a uh, normative discipline and uh, there is another point that is it is more integrative. It takes and uh, in, uh, everything in totality. And that uh, viewpoint is very essential in, in, in the context of development also. But whether we are, when, whenever we put on and we are making some development, we should, we should take into account all the aspects of uh, human life along with the ecological suspension. These two things should be kept in mind. Uh, it examines all concepts and theories, evidences from a critical but impartial point of view, thereby unreal prejudices, if any, and puts forward only those claims that are just wise and right. And we know philosophy is a normative discourse with consciousness of the axiological dynamics, <coughs> along with higher degree of integration, leading us to the path of liberation, be it mundane or otherwise. Uh, I mean, I can get a question of the, uh, some notion of applied philosophy. Uh, philosophy can be uh, uh, done in two ways, uh, which is philosophy for philosophy's sake, that is called pure philosophy. And another is that we mix philosophy uh, with a particular point of view that I shall make some things <coughs> on this world. <coughs> that is something different. Sir, mobile day table is again. This type of philosophy has some, we have, we have uh, followed some criteria for that. But what is applied philosophy? What is pure philosophy, you know. In the manner of philosophy, there are some students, some scholars, some teachers uh, within the bounds of their departmental uh, compartment, they discuss something and those discussions uh, actually uh, do not go to other people and uh, they do philosophy for their own sake. Uh, and that is called pure philosophy or philosophy for philosophy's sake. I, I cannot deny that, but it, it, it has to be done because philosophy has its own way and that way should not be stopped and that should go on. Uh, the question of applied philosophy is something different. That is called any exploration of philosophy is applied if and only it is relevant to the important questions of our present life. Amar jee almost ayat se jee juge baas koi. Shey juge politik chite, amar philosophy ta, amar theory ta kaje aste kena. That is relevance is very important. Second, an exploration of philosophy is applied if and only it in, engages us in a comparatively specific question within some branch of philosophy like epistemology or moral philosophy to which it belongs. And in philosophy, I am not sure 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 I I am not and I have, to, I have to try to give some specific answer to that. Because my thought, uh, philosophy cannot give the ultimate answer, as, as also science cannot. I want to make sure science has to give the ultimate answer. No, science has to give the ultimate answer. Science has to give the ultimate answer. We have to give the ultimate answer. We have to give the ultimate answer. We have to give the technology. We have to give the ultimate answer. 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 
সেই এবং একই রকম ভাবে ফিলোসফি ক্ষেত্রে তাই আমরা অনেক সময় ফিলোসফি প্রবলেমটাকে প্রবলেম করতে ভুল করি আমরা সব আলটিমেট কোশ্চেনটাকে সামনে নিয়ে আসার চেষ্টা করি আলটিমেট কোশ্চেন নিয়ে এসে আমরা প্রেজেন্ট লাইফ বা বর্তমানটা অস্বীকার করি দ্যাট ইস দ্যাট ইজ দ্য কোশ্চেন অফ ইউর ফিলোসফি আই এম নট স্পিকিং অন দ্যাট পয়েন্ট অ্যান্ড থার্ডলি ইন দিস স্পেসিফিক কোশ্চেন হোয়াট ইউ হোয়াট ওয়াট টু ডু ইন এ পার্টিকুলার কন্টেক্স দ্যাট ফিলোসফি মাস্ট গিভ এস সাম ডাইরেকশন what what to do in this particular developmental discourse they have they must have some specific points that should be uh, uh, should be uh, <coughs> conducted that should be accepted for all and that is called that is what what to do that is a value question moral value question and thirdly uh, it must have certain causal effects on this world some causal effects আমি অনেক কিছু ফিলোসফি তো অনেক কিছু বললাম অনেক থিউরি বললাম আমাদের যেমন নটা সিস্টেম আছে ইন্ডিয়ান সিস্টেম ওয়েস্টার্ন ফিলোসফি অনেক কিছু আমরা পড়াই এবং নেট সেটের সিলেবাসটা দেখলে মনে হয় যে বোধ হয় সব আমরা বিআর পিআর দেখা একটা কমবি কিন্তু সেগুলো যে কতটা আমার প্র্যাকটিক্যাল লাইফের বাস্তব জীবনে প্রয়োজনে লাগে বা আমি সেটা ব্যবহার করতে পারি সেটা খুঁজলে কিন্তু অনেক সমস্যা তৈরি হয় সেখানে বলা হচ্ছে যে দ্য পয়েন্ট ইস টু চেঞ্জ ইট যে আমি ফিলোসফিটিকে পরিবর্তনের জন্য কীভাবে ব্যবহার করতে পারি ইন্টারপ্রিটেশন অনেক রকমই হতে পারে একই বিষয়ের একাধিক ইন্টারপ্রিটেশন এবং আমাদের একজন দার্শনিক ফান্ড বলছেন যে ফিলোসফি ইজ এ ইজ অ্যান এন্ডলেস ইজ এ ফিল্ড অফ এন্ডলেস কন্ট্রোভার্সি হয়ে গেছে যে যার যা মনে হচ্ছে বলে যাচ্ছেন এবং একটা থিওরি আছে তিনি বলেন না ওটা ভুল তিনি একটা নতুন থিওরি দিয়ে গেলেন সেখানে একাধিক থিওরি আমদানি হচ্ছে কিন্তু প্র্যাকটিক্যালি প্রবলেমটাকে সলভ করার ক্ষেত্রে আমরা কিন্তু এগিয়ে যাচ্ছি দ্যাট টাইপ অফ ফিলোসফি শুড বি অ্যাভয়েডেড we have to make some philosophy that is that is actually can change something on this planet that is the uh, point of action and uh, the use of specific philosophical methodology ekhane ekta kotha bolmo bolar dorkar je philosophy ami kintu ultimately philosophy moddhei achi ami to ekbari sociology te chole jacchi na ami bolmo political science e chole jacchi na tale seta kibhabe determine hobe je amar ei point ta sociological historical পলিটিক্যাল সায়েন্টিস্টের পয়েন্ট অফ ভিউ থেকে বলছে না ফিলোসফিক্যাল পয়েন্ট অফ ভিউ সেখানে বলছে যে মেথডোলজি ফিলোসফি কিছু স্পেশাল স্পেসিফিক মেথডোলজি বলে দিবে যে আই এম ডুইং ফিলোসফি আই এম নট ডুইং সোশিওলজি অ্যান্ড দ্যাট ইজ অ্যানাদার পয়েন্ট অ্যান্ড ফাইনালি ইট শুড বি ওয়েল ফ্রম অ্যাজ দ্য লেটেস্ট এম্পিরিক্যাল এভিডেন্সেস প্রোভাইডেড বাই ন্যাচারাল সোশ্যাল অ্যান্ড হিউম্যান সায়েন্সেস এখানে একটা কথা অনেককে আমরা বলি যেখানে বিজ্ঞানের শেষ সেখানে দর্শনের শুরু এটা একবারে ফুল কথা বিজ্ঞান যে প্রশ্নের উত্তর দিতে পারে না দর্শন সেই প্রশ্নের উত্তর দিতে পারে না এক বিজ্ঞানী আসলে কোনো নলেজ তৈরি করতে পারে ফিলোসফি কি করতে পারে ওই নলেজগুলোর মধ্যে ইন্টিগ্রেশন নিয়ে আসতে পারে যে একটা নলেজের সঙ্গে আর একটা নলেজের সম্পর্ক কি হবে ফিজিক্স যেটা বলছে বায়োলজি যে জিনিসটা নিয়ে আসছে সেটা আমাদের কাছে অ্যাকসেপ্টেবল হবে কি হবে না এই প্রশ্নটা শেখ করতে পারে रेशनलिटी কিন্তু আজকে সে ধারণাটা বদলে গেছে এখন বলা হচ্ছে যে বিজ্ঞানের যে লেটেস্ট ইনভেনশন সেটাকে মাথায় রেখে কথা বলতে হবে তা নাহলে তোমার ফিলোসফি অ্যাপ্লাই ফিলোসফি নয় সে ফর এক্সাম্পল হিউম্যান জেনম প্রজেক্ট হিউম্যান জেনম প্রজেক্ট দে হ্যাভ কালেক্টেড এ ফার্স্ট ডেটা অ্যাবাউট আওয়ার জেনম জিন পুল অ্যান্ড দ্যাট জিন পুল হাউ টু অ্যাপ্লাই দোজ জিন দোজ ইনফরমেশন ফর হিউম্যান পারপাসেস ফর দ্য ম্যান কাইন্ড and that respect we have to uh, say something on that aspect that is social uh, econ- uh, social moral or uh, uh, human aspects and these points these points could not come if the human genome project was not executed so uh, latest scientific data is very important for the inclusion and finally it is intended for people at large uh, to non philosophy audience also 
it is, this is the most important point that uh, whatever we do philosophy uh, it is uh, mostly the, it is within the uh, some teachers and students of the philosophy department that should not be done that my philosophy my points of view as a philosophy uh, should be accepted or should be understood by by larger audience and uh, he saying that non philosophy and traditionally as a philosophy chapter no is it some that is philosophy to me karal kana ama kotha ta mane bujhte pare otherwise i am not doing applied philosophy in development sector ek rakham prashno eta obosshoi ekta applied philosophy prashno hobe applied philosophy onek rakham er shakha onek kotha bola hoy ekhane je prashno gulo amar kache relevant hobe applied ethics environmental ethics applied metaphysics applied epistemology applied logic bibhinno dhoroner application e prashno aste pare amar kache jeta ekhane relevant hobe seta hocche applied ethics environmental philosophy এখানে এই প্রসঙ্গে সেনের যে কনসেপ্টটা তিনি জন রলস যে সব প্রস্তাবগুলো করলেন রলস এর থিওরি অফ জাস্টিস এর কথা আমরা জানি জাস্টিস অফ ফেয়ারনেস তার রিফ্লেক্টিভ ইকুইলিব্রিয়াম অরিজিনাল পজিশন রিয়েল অফ ইগনোরেন্স আমরা অনেক কিছু থিওরি পড়লাম কিভাবে জাস্টিস আনা সম্ভব অল দিস থিংস আর ডিসকাস বাই রলস কিন্তু অমর্ত সেন এসে বলছেন যে বাস্তবতা কি বলে আপনি তো অনেক তাত্ত্বিক কথা বললেন বাস্তবতা কি যে ধরনের জাস্টিস বা ইকুয়ালিটি বা যে সব সুযোগ সুবিধা সরকার তৈরি করছে সেগুলো অ্যাকসেপ্ট করার ব্যাপারে যারা যারা যাদের যারা বেনিফিশিয়ারি হবে তাদের সেই সামর্থ্য আছে কিনা ক্যাপেবিলিটি তিনি ক্যাপেবিলিটি প্রশ্নটাকে নিয়ে নেন এই যে ক্যাপেবিলিটি অ্যাপ্রোচ এটাকে বলা হচ্ছে যে উপর থেকে আমি কতগুলো ফর্মুলা কতগুলো কথা দিলাম হ্যাঁ কিন্তু বাস্তবে অ্যাকসেপ্ট করার মতো অবস্থায় আছে কিনা যেমন আমি একটা বাস্তব দৃষ্টান্ত দিয়েছি গতকাল কৃষিকাল নিয়ে আমার বন্ধু আমার ছাত্র কথা বলছিলেন আর কি আসি কোথায় গেলেন আমিও ছেলে আর কি ও যে কথাগুলো বলছে সব মানুষগুলো আমার কাছে পরিষ্কার ভাবে বুঝতে পারছিলাম আর কি যে যে এখন সরকার কৃষকদের জন্য কিছু পাঁচ হাজার দশ হাজার কি একটা টাকা বিভিন্ন রকম কৃষিকাজের জন্য হ্যাঁ তা আমাদের আমার ভাই কৃষিকাজের কাজটা করে কিন্তু জমিগুলোর সেই বাবাদের দাদুদের আমলে সেই সব নামগুলো এখনো পর্যন্ত সেই নামেই রয়েছে আমার ভাই বা ভাইয়ের ছেলে তারা কিন্তু ওই টাকাটা নিতে পারে হ্যাঁ এবারে বলা হচ্ছে তাহলে তুই নামগুলো কাটিয়ে সবগুলো আমার আর তোর নামে করিয়ে নে হ্যাঁ সে অনেক টাকা খরচ প্রায় এক লাখ টাকা খরচ হবে রেজিস্ট্রেশন থেকে সেই জন্য সে নিতে পারছে না তাহলে আমি যেটা বলার চেষ্টা করছি সরকারের একটা প্রকল্প ডাকলেই যে বেনিফিশিয়ারি সে পাবে সরাসরি তা কিন্তু পাবে না তাকে ক্যাপেবল হতে পারে এক্সট্রা এক লাখ টাকা খরচ করতে হবে ওই পাঁচ হাজার টাকা পাওয়ার জন্য আমি কোন অবস্থাতে আছি আর ডুইং হচ্ছে আমি কি কি কাজ করতে পারি আমার কি কি সামর্থ্য আছে আমি কি লিটারেট যদি লিটারেট হয় তাহলে আমি সাইন করতে পারি আমি খবর ব্যবহার করতে পারি হ্যাঁ এগুলো ডুইং এর মধ্যে পড়ে আর আমি কোন পজিশনে আছি যেমন এখানে সোশ্যাল পজিশন কাস্ট রিজন থেকে শুরু করে ক্লাস কাস্ট অনেকগুলো বিষয় আছে উনি দুটো শব্দের মধ্যে এটাকে ধরার চেষ্টা করছেন ডুইংস অ্যান্ড ডিংস দ্য ক্যাপেবিলিটিস টু কমিট অ্যান্ড অ্যাক্ট টু রিলেট অ্যান্ড অ্যাট্রাক্ট ব্যালেন্স ডাইভার্সিটি অ্যান্ড কোয়েহারেন্স টু ক্রিয়েট রেজাল্টস অ্যান্ড টু অ্যাডপ্ট অ্যান্ড সেলফ রিনিউ আর রিগার্ডেড বাই দ্য ক্যাপেবিলিটি ফিল্ডস সাচ অ্যাজ দ্য কোর ক্যাপেবিলিটি দ্যাট অ্যালাউ অর্গানাইজেশনস টু পারফর্ম টু সাসটেন দেমসেলফ ইন ইভলভিং এনভায়রনমেন্ট फ्रीडम Uh, of thought would amount to a severe constraint on the reach of a rationality. Sri rationality ki kotha bolchen, choice er kotha bolchen, capability kotha bolchen. Ei gulo na thakle ei je jekono dhoroner development sela kintu sokole jader jonno development tader kache pouchhe. Ar Omit Padri notion to title type bole dicche dignity with dignity prashno ta tulchen je development ta dignity. Jemon goto kal je kotha gulo hocchilo je kichu kaj ta ke amra dignified act dignified behavior hisebe consider kori na and that is one of the main points je amra kichu kichu aaj ke gurutwo na diye amra chota khata ekta kaj korbo amra je dekha jacche je kothay ei dikhe 
স্বর্ণ কাজে কাজ করতে যায় সেখানে হয়তো হাজার পাঁচ হাজার টাকা পায় হ্যাঁ বাড়িতে এসে হয়তো কিছু জমি জায়গা আছে চাষবাস করার সুযোগ ছিল সেটা করছে না এক নম্বর চাষবাস করা যথেষ্ট কঠিন এবং এখন খরচ অনেক বেড়ে গেছে দ্বিতীয় পয়েন্ট হচ্ছে কি তারা ওইটুকু কষ্ট করবে না এসব বিষয়গুলো আছে যেহেতু ডিগনিটি অ্যাভেলেবেল প্রশ্ন সেই জায়গাগুলো রয়েছে এখানে ডিগনিটি বলতে উনি কিন্তু বলতে চাইছেন যে হিউম্যান বিং হিসাব चेस्टा कर in violation value of human individual being তাকে ডিগনিটি বলে উনি মিল করতে চাইছেন তারপরে পাঁচ কিছু কথা বলছেন যে মানুষের একটা ইনহেরেন্ট একটা ইনসিনজিক ডিগনিটি আছে সেটা কোনো রকম ভাবে কোনো ভাবে সেটাকে আমি কম্প্রোমাইজ করতে পারি না and that type of uh, being that is is saying that uh, keep every rational being including yourself always as an end never as a mere means as a as an end I am something different, and that type of dignity uh, should be accorded to every human individual. Uh, and uh, there is also to be to treat every person always as a man and never merely as a means. Uh, the moralized concept of dignity does not take its origin in the early modern era. It was celebrated by Giovanni Scipio della Mirandola, version on the dignity of man in the year uh, 1486. बैबल स्वीकार क्षेत्रीय अमरत्य सें पॉइंट प्रैक्टिकल डाउन टू आर्थ कर चेस्ट कर सस्टेनेबिलिटी कन्सेप्ट सबा जानी गुरु हारलैंड ब्रुलैंड जो प्रसंगटा नहीं लें डेभलपमेंट करते गए न्याचारे रिसोर्सेस एक्सटेड हो जा शुड स्टप आवर डेभलपमेंट तक अनेक प्रश्न उठल जो दे आर सो मे कान्ट्रीज डेभलपिंग कान्ट्रीज आंडार डेभलप कान्ट्रीज से सामान्य पभार्टी शुरू कर न्यूनतम मानुषे थार मत व्यवस्था है तक डेभलपमेंट हमें क्यों बन कर तक एक प्रोपोजल हलो सस्टेबिलिटी प्रोपोजल जे किपिंग अल द रिसोर्सेस इंटैक्ट फर द फ्यूचार जेनारेशन हमें क्या करते हैं जदि कथाटार मध्य एक वैपरित आब भविष्य प्रजन्म सबकि अक्षत रेखे हमें डेभलपमेंट करते हैं से डेभलपमेंटर धारणा देखिए सस्टेनेबल डेभलपमेंट सस्टेनेबल तीन टी गोल आज थ्री गोल्स एथिकल ट्रिटमेंट अफ ह्यूमान एंड नन ह्यूमान फार्ष्ट सेकेंड इज इनिशिएटिव फर मिटिंग ह्यूमैन नीड्स बेस्ड अन टेक्नोलॉजी दैट आर इकोलॉजिकल रेसपन्स इकोलॉजिकल रेसपन्सिबल टेक्नोलॉजी व्यवहार करार कथा बोल थार्ड एडिकुएट एटीट्यूड नर्मल पलिसी टूवर्ड्स न्याचरल इको सिसटेम एंड रिजेनारेटिव कैपासिटी फसल फलाले गाज प्रकृति रिपोर्ट कर लेकिन रिजेनारेट करते आयोजन पे जमन धान लगा धान परवर्ती धान लगाते क्षति हो तत्सत्व जो धान लगानों 
কেমিক্যাল ফার্টিলাইজার বা বা ব্যবহার করছে তখন কিন্তু পরবর্তী পর্যায়ে জানা যাচ্ছে কি সেই সেই ফসল তার হচ্ছে না দুই এক বছর বলতে জমিটাকে তুলে রাখতে হবে কারণ আর ফসল করছে না তাহলে সেখানে সাসটেনেবল হচ্ছে না আমি আমি যে কেমিক্যাল ফার্টিলাইজার অতিরিক্ত ব্যবহার করে ঘটনাগুলো বলছি এন্ড ইকোসিস্টেম ইজ এ বিষয়গুলো রয়েছে হোয়াট উই ক্যান ডু বাই অ্যাড্রেসিং দ্য এথিক্যাল অ্যাসপেক্টস অফ দ্য স্টেট অফ বিটুইন ইন্টারজেনারেশনাল এন্ড ফিমেন অ্যাসপেক্টস এন্ড ইন্টারজেনারেশনাল রিকোয়ারমেন্টস ইন এ ওয়ার্ল্ড অফ স্কেয়ার্স রিসোর্সেস রিসোর্স সব সময় স্কেয়ার থাকে এখনো স্কেয়ার আছে সেই স্কেয়ার রিসোর্সকে ভবিষ্যতের জন্য রেখে আমরা কিভাবে কাজ করতে পারি বাই ড্রয়িং অ্যাটেনশন টু আনসাস্টেনেবল হিউম্যান প্র্যাকটিসেস বাই ফর্মুলেটিং সিস্টেমেটিক সায়েন্স ইন ফর অ্যান্থ্রোপোজেনিক অ্যাক্টিভিটিস ডাইরেক্টলি ইমপ্লিকেটেড ইন দ্য লস অফ হিউম্যান লাইফ ফ্লোর অফ ফনা অ্যাজ ওয়েল অ্যাজ ডিফারেন্ট ইকোসিস্টেম অ্যান্থ্রোপোজেনিক এই প্রকৃতির যে যে ভারসাম্যের অবস্থা তার জন্য তো প্রাণী তো তাই নয় মনুষ্য সমাজই তাই আমাদের প্রতিদিনকার যে বিহেভিয়ার এবং এই বিহেভিয়ারের ক্ষেত্রে আমরা আমাদেরকে বলি অলওয়েজ সে কারণে ন্যাশনাল ইভেন্টিং কিন্তু আমাদের যে বিহেভিয়ার সেই বিহেভিয়ার জন্য কিন্তু প্রমাণ করা হয় যে আমরা ন্যাশনাল দিই আমরা কারণে অকারণে বিভিন্ন ধরনের কি বলবো পটকা ফটাই বিভিন্ন ধরনের কাজ করি বিভিন্ন ধরনের অকারণ মাইন্ড মাইন্ড বাজাই এসব ভাবলে মনে হয় যে আমরা ঠিক বুদ্ধি বুদ্ধি সম্পন্ন পাই না এটাকে মনে হবে না আমি যদি রাস্তায় গাড়ি দেখবেন কোনো কারণ নেই বাচ্চা আমার ছেলে ছোটবেলা দিকে যদি বাবা আগে কোনো পুজো আছে মাইক কাটছে হ্যাঁ তো আমারও তাই মনে হয় যে কিছু একটা কেউ হয়তো মারা গেছে তাই মাইক বাজানো হচ্ছে একটা বাড়িতে একটা অনুষ্ঠান হচ্ছে তা একটা বেশ ইন্টারেস্টিং গল্প গ্রামে যে বাবার সাথ তা সে সব কিছু ব্যবস্থা করেছে তা তার মনে হয়েছে কি সবই যখন করলাম মাইকটা কেন করবো আর তাহলে মাইক না হলে মনে হয় কিছু যেন হচ্ছে না সে বললো যে কিছু পয়সা পেয়েছি ছিল বাবার জন্য একটা মাইক করতে তো এরকম একটা অবস্থা আমাদের অবস্থা যে কারণে অকারণে আমরা যে বিহেভিয়ার দূর করি দ্যাট ডাজ নট সিগনিফাই দ্যাট ইউ আর অ্যাকচুয়ালি রেসার দ্যান হিউম্যান um this happy by articulating adequate norm and theory of value reflective of hand value reflective of human nature relation human nature relation er prashno ta ebong ei sustainability prashno ta amader ekta pokkho chilo je ekhane je sustainability dharona ta actually sei shomoy na holo sei shomoy kintu dharona ta for human being ami jokhon bolchi je porobortik prajonmo bortoman prajonmo sekhane kintu প্র্যাকটিক্যালি আমরা মানুষের কথাই বলছি বাই হুক অর বাই হুক কিন্তু পরবর্তীকালে বলা হলো যে না এখানে কিন্তু শুধু মানুষের কথা বললে কিন্তু আপনার প্রকৃতিকে সঙ্গে নিয়ে চলতে হবে সেই জায়গা থেকে এই বিষয়গুলো আসছে এবং এখানে পপুলেশনের ব্যাপারটা তো রয়েছে সাংঘাতিক ধরনের যে ধরনের পপুলেশন আমাদের সেটা আর্থের যে ক্যারিং ক্যাপাসিটি সেই ক্যারিং ক্যাপাসিটিটা অনেক আগেই ক্রস করে গেছে এবং সেটা একটা বড় ধরনের প্রবলেম আমাদের কি করতে হবে সেখানে কতগুলো এখানে কতগুলো ডিপ টেকনোলজি প্ল্যাটফর্ম বলে একটা ইন্টারন্যাশনাল একটা ক্লাব আছে আর কি এনভায়রনমেন্টাল ক্লাব যেমন আর্থ ফাস্ট থেকে শুরু করে ওয়ার্ল্ড ওয়াইড ফান্ড ফর্ম বিভিন্ন রকমের ক্লাব আছে তার মধ্যে একটা ক্লাবের নাম হচ্ছে ডিপ ইকোলজি প্ল্যাটফর্ম তারা কতগুলো কন্ডিশনস দিয়েছে সেই ক্লাবের মেম্বারশিপ ক্যাটাগরি এই কন্ডিশনগুলো কমপ্লিট করতে হয় বলছে যে দা ফ্লারিশিং অফ হিউম্যান এন্ড নন হিউম্যান লিভিং বিংস হ্যাজ ইনচেঞ্জিং ওয়ার্ক দা ওয়ার্ক অফ নন হিউম্যান বিংস ইজ ইন্ডিপেন্ডেন্ট অফ দা ইউজফুলনেস ফর হিউম্যান পারপাসেস নন হিউম্যান বিং কে আমরা ইউজ করি আমরা ভাবি যে সেটা মানুষের পক্ষে কতটা ইউজফুল সেই রেসপেক্টে আমরা নন হিউম্যান অ্যানিমেলস নন হিউম্যান বিংস কে বিচার করি দ্যাট শুড বি আপারে রিচনেস এন্ড ভ্যারাইটি অফ লাইফ ফর্মস অন আর্থ ইনক্লুডিং ফর্মস অফ হিউম্যান কালচারস হ্যাভিং ইনচেঞ্জিং কোয়ার্ট হিউম্যানস হ্যাভ নো রাইট টু রিডিউস দিস রিচনেস এন্ড ডাইভার্সিটি এক্সসেপ্ট টু স্যাটিসফাই ভাইটাল নিডস এখানে একটা কথা বলা হচ্ছে যে যে রিচনেস ডাইভার্সিটি প্রকৃতির মধ্যে রয়েছে সেটা আমাদের যেটুকু ভাইটাল নিড সেটা সেটার প্রয়োজনে সেটাকে নষ্ট মানে ব্যবহার করা যেতে পারে অন্য রকম আমাদের যেগুলো নন ভাইটাল নিডস হ্যাঁ আমাদের বলি নন বেসিক নিডস তার জন্য সেগুলোকে নষ্ট করা চলবে কিন্তু আমরা যা কনজিউম করি হ্যাঁ সেটা কিন্তু দেখবেন বেশিরভাগ অংশটাই মানে কি বলবো নন বেসিক আমরা কোনো একটা অনুষ্ঠান বাড়িতে যে পরিমাণ খাদ্য গ্রহণ করি তার থেকে বেশি বর্জ্য উৎপাদন উৎপাদন করি সেই সেখানে গেলে আমরা মনে হবে যে সত্যি যে আমরা কতটা প্রয়োজনের জন্য খাচ্ছি আর কতটা অপ্রয়োজনের জন্য খাচ্ছি এই নন বেসিক নিড এবং বেসিক নিডের মধ্যে পার্থক্য অনেকে বলছেন যে এত রিলেটিভ ব্যাপার আমার কাছে যেটা বেসিক আপনার কাছে সেটা নন বেসিক হতে পারে সবই সত্য কিন্তু এটা সাধারণ বুদ্ধিতে ধরা পড়ে যে কোনটা বেসিক নিডস আর কোনটা নন বেসিক নিডস সেখানে ওনারা বলছেন যে একটা জায়গায় আমাদের আসতে হবে যে সেই জায়গাতে আমাদেরকে কন্ট্রোল করতে হবে যাতে প্র
the flourishing of human life and cultures is compatible with the sustainably uh, uh, smaller human population. Human population can keep up a control. It is not violence and matter of life. If you get to the end of the day, you can't get to the end of the day. So, we have to do the policy. We have to do the human population, human population explosion. Present human interference with the non human world is excessive. And the situation is rapidly worsening. Who is not going to be able to do the same thing? And the foregoing points indicate that changes are necessary in the dominant ways humans until now have behaved in the relation to the earth and the world. The changes will, in a fundamental manner, affect political, social, technological, economic, and ideological structure. Even the ideological structure of the philosophy and sociology on a key to be The ideological changes in the rich countries will mainly be that of increased appreciation of life quality rather than high material standard of living. It is a quantitative language and make the standard of living to define for us. It is not a very good thing. If we have a life quality, then we can have a lot of business. 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 It is a standard of living. A quantitative approach to the quality of life. And the ideological change is in the rich countries will mainly be that of increased appreciation of life quality rather than high material standard of living in this very preparing for the way of a global state of ecologically sustainable development. Both who subscribe and both who are subscribed for it, they touch directly by indirectly a piece of Kajet Swami. Our Shudhu Kotha Boli, Barbara Swami Nath Boli, if Kajet Gethupo Amapur Te Kora Sambha, Gethupo Amra Kori Na. ये जगह तो ते सबसे भी बहुत फंस चुके हैं। मिलेंगे हम बोलेंगे पता जाने में सेकंड जेब जगह में जो खोलो, एक तो जो खोलो जेब शुद्ध ह्यूमन पार्टस टाइप ग्रुप्स को ना इकने ऐसे इकोलॉजी ऐसे हो ना कि बिचारे मोते आस्था भी ऐसा मोता है। सेकंड पॉइंट है लस्सो सारी इकोलॉजी, जेब ये परिवेश अतः पर यार मैं बोल रहा हूँ जब तो कि प्रैक्टिकल भाषा में आपको तो थक गए डेवलपमेंट चीज़ में तो हम ये तो आपको नहीं होते पड़ेगा इस सोशल इकोलॉजी चेक इन तो इतने जो करा हुए वो निकालने को जेम्स और ताकि कोर्ट के लिए एनवायरनमेंटल सस्टेनेबल चीज़ समझे प्रॉपर्टी प्रोस्टेक्ट जेम्स गुलाब uh, my concluding points are, we have to extend commitment to intrinsic inherent values beyond homo sapiens uh, and should carry on developmental projects with dignity, dignity for all that live on this lone planet, including members of uh, human and non-human species, adopting a holistic and balanced ecocentric worldview and behaving responsibly in its today's planet and world. I conclude that Gandhi is off quoted as a well. We have enough for our food, but not for our trees. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Shantosh Kumar Pal, for his interesting lecture and here's the certificate. Okay, thank you. Sir, with you, Sir. Uh, I now invite questions. We now invite questions for Professor Shantosh Kumar Pal. Thank you. I now invite Professor Shridhartha Mitra to uh, take Dr. Dan. अनुरोध कर बाहर है हमारे अमून एक ता एक ता पॉलोनियल इंपोजिशन था कि जब हम लोग सोशल इंग्लिश ही बोलते हैं इंग्लिश सर अपनों चर्चा है ना इधर वाला अंततो खूब चला इंग्लिश जैसे तारा मुने करेना 
আমরা যারা অল্প ইংরেজি জানি আমরা মনে তো বক্তব্যটা সেভাবে রাখা দরকার যাতে সব লেভেলে পৌঁছায় সেখানে বাংলা ইংরেজি দুটো আসতে পারে বাইরে নাম্বার ওয়ান নাম্বার টু আমার সন্ততার কাছে একটা আমার অবজারভেশন যে উনি যেটা বললেন যে সায়েন্সের যে লেটেস্ট ডেভেলপমেন্ট সেখানে ফিলোসফি শুরু করে পৃথিবীতে আসবে কিন্তু একটা ডিসক্রিমিনেশন তৈরি হবে কারণ সবাই সেই টাকা পৌঁছাতে পারবে না গরিব লোক সেই প্রজেক্টের আওতা করবে না এই যদি হিউম্যান নতুন ড্রেসের মধ্যে দিয়ে যে একটা ডিসক্রিমিনেশন এবং নট অনলি দ্যাট এই যদি হিউম্যান যেরকম প্রজেক্ট যে টেকনোলজিক্যাল যে ডেভেলপমেন্টের মধ্যে দিয়ে যেটা আমরা পেতে চলেছি এটা হবি সেই ক্ষেত্রে ফিলোসফি অবজারভেশন আমি আপনি ঠিকই বলেছেন এখানে যে কথাটা বলার আর হিউম্যান জেনো প্রজেক্টের যখন প্রজেক্টটা চলছিল দশ বছর ধরে চলেছে থেকে দশ বছর প্রজেক্টটা চলেছে গোটা পৃথিবীতে যত মানুষ আছে তাদের জেনো তার একটা মানে ম্যাটিং এবং সিকুয়েন্সিং কমপ্লিট হয়েছে এবং প্রচুর তথ্য আমাদের সামনে আসবে তার ভিত্তিতে অনেক কিছু ঘটনা অনেক কিছু বিষয় সামনে আসবে যেমন জিন থেরাপি থেকে শুরু করে হ্যাঁ এদিকে জেনেটিক এনহান্সমেন্ট তারপরে ইউজেনিক্স এর প্রশ্ন যেটা আপনি বললেন ইউজেনিক্স এর প্রশ্ন এটা ভালো এবং তার সঙ্গে প্রজেক্টের একটা অংশ রাখা হয়েছিল তার সোশ্যাল মডাল লিগ্যাল ইস্যুগুলোকে বিচার করার জন্য এবং সেইখান থেকে আমাদের যে বায়োমেডিক্যাল এথিক্স যেটা আমরা পড়া সেখানে এই প্রশ্নের জন্য আলোচনা আছে যে আমরা রিপ্রোডাকটিভ ক্লোনিং করবো কি না তারপরে যে ধরনের রেসিজেন এর প্রশ্নগুলো আছে প্রত্যেকটা প্রশ্ন এখানে কিন্তু রেলিভেন্ট এবং এখানেই মরাল ফিলোসফি বা ফিলোসফি সমান গুরুত্ব তারাও বিষয়গুলো কোনটা অ্যাকসেপ্ট হবে অ্যাকসেপ্টেবল হবে কোনটা অ্যাকসেপ্টেবল হবে যেমন ক্লোনিংয়ের ক্ষেত্রে আমরা অ্যানিমেলের উপর ক্লোনিং করছি হিউম্যান ক্লোনিং কিন্তু গোটা পৃথিবীতে ব্যান্ড আছে তাহলে সেই কাজগুলো তার যে সোশ্যাল মরাল ইমপ্লিকেশনস সেগুলো সমানভাবে গুরুত্ব দিতে হবে সেখানে আজকে বিজ্ঞানের সঙ্গে সঙ্গে ফিলসফি মরাল ফিলসফি সোশিওলজি তাদের গুরুত্ব অনেক বেশি বেড়ে গেছে যে তারা কী গাইডলাইনস তৈরি করছে সেই জন্য এখন এই সামান্য বর্ধমান বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ে যদি কেউ কোনো প্রপোজাল সাবমিট করে যেটা মানুষের জীবন নিয়ে বা মানুষের অ্যানিমেল আমি কমিটিতে যেতে হবে সেই কমিটিতে আমিও আছি সেখানে তাদের পারমিশন নিতে হবে যেমন একজন মেডিকেল কলেজের প্রিন্সিপাল ওই কমিটিতে আছেন আমার বর্ধমান মেডিকেল কলেজে উনি এখন ভাইস চ্যান্সেলর একজন সমিত আছে উনি বলছেন যে আমি কোথাও থুতু ফেলেছি সেই থুতুটা নিয়ে যদি গবেষণা করতে চাই তাহলে আমার পারমিশন এরকম অনেক নিয়ম কারণের কথা উনি বলছেন সেখানে এইখানে কিন্তু অ্যাকচুয়ালি ফিলসফি এবং সোশ্যাল সায়েন্সের গুরুত্ব কিন্তু অনেক বড় বিজ্ঞান কিন্তু যে তথ্যগুলো নিয়ে এসছে তারা বলছে যে আমরা বিচার করে দেখুন কোনটা অ্যাকসেপ্ট করা হবে কোনটা অ্যাকসেপ্ট করা হবে সেই জন্য এখানে বলা হচ্ছে বিজ্ঞানের তথ্যটাকে সামনে এনে দার্শনিকদের সমাজতাত্ত্বিকদের হ্যাঁ পলিটিক্যাল সায়েন্টিস্টদের ঠিক করতে হবে তারা কিন্তু ঠিক আছে ধন্যবাদ থ্যাংক ইউ
I invite Shweta Ma'am and and over the chair to Professor Manishwarma. And handing the session to Professor Manishwarma. Thank you so much. And just, just, just there's a little bit of corrections in the program, which you just spoke. Uh, along with Professor Sita Prasad, I'd like to have 10 minutes lecture from Professor Patra also. He came here from uh, Calcutta with us and he has to go back. So I'll request Professor Sita Prasad to confine her lecture for uh, within 20 minutes only. And then after that we can have 10 minutes lecture, 10 to 15 minutes lecture from Professor Patra. So we'll begin with Professor Sita Prasad lecture. So please come back. And try to confine your lecture within 20 minutes only. So we have, 11, we have already 11.25, so by 11.45 you can complete your lecture. Yeah, I'll try my best to do that. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for inviting me. 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 Thank you so, good morning everyone. Uh, big nature is on the dais, big nature is off the dais, my dear students and friends. I uh, will be speaking on, uh, you have gone through that uh, seminar uh, and the title is Recalibrating Development for Gender Justice. But for three, four days back, I received a message from Professor Banerjee asking me to speak on perspectives on gender and development. So I somewhere try to incorporate both these dimensions into my presentation. And uh, I'll be speaking on the perspectives of gender and development and then speaking a little about uh, uh, development with gender justice. So I find ourselves, not only me, I find ourselves fortunate that at least today we are discussing uh, development with dignity. Why? Because when we use the word development with dignity, that means we have achieved a certain level of development where we are at least in a position to talk about dignity. First thing is development and uh, dignity comes later and it can be part of the process of development as well. So, but if we are thinking of development with dignity today, that means, in my opinion, we have achieved a certain level of development where we can think of development with dignity. Now, coming to development, gender and development. Uh, it's a field, a separate field of study that has developed uh, in last nearly 50 years. Initially, we did not used to talk about gender and development and in fact development itself because the de word development also has its origin in post world war ii era and gender is a product of 60s and 70s uh, a product of new social movement so now combining both these gender and development and uh, as i was saying that uh, once upon a time we are talking about today gender and development but but uh, once we have also seen a period when women, when I'm uh, using the word gender, please uh, keep in mind that I'll mostly be focusing on women and not other genders as has been the trend uh, most of the time. Though recently we have started incorporating other genders also, but I would, would not go into that area. So, uh, what I was saying that uh, we have started talking about women uh, in the context of development, but there was a time when uh, women were not at all discussed in the context of development and it was assumed that the development of families and uh, will, uh, in fact, the impact will trickle down to the women of the <coughs> families. So, at least we are fortunate that we are talking about uh, uh, women in the context of development. So, as we know, the paradigms of development has been changing over the period of time and basically we talk, when we talk about gender and development, we talk about uh, three main perspectives. 
women that can get women in development, women and development, and gender and development. So all these perspectives I'll be taking into uh, my discussion and presentation and how it has recalibrated development from the perspective of women. So what I was saying that uh, initially women the were focus of development only for the uh, purposes of welfare. So as uh, we were speaking about how uh, paradigms has been changing. So women came into the focus uh, in development as objects of welfare concerns and uh, basically as uh, focus was on mother and uh, welfare of mother and children health, health and other concerns. Uh, as Professor Banerjee was saying is yesterday that uh, yes, uh, health is also one of the criteria of, and uh, happiness is also one of the criteria of uh, development with dignity. So, initially women were focused on only welfare activities. Then in 1970s comes a book titled Econ uh, Women's Role in Economic Development by Esther Bozra. And this bo uh, book was a seminal work and uh, that highlighted that whatever is being said that uh, the through trickle down effect the benefits of development will reach to women. It's not correct because, uh, and she has given several reasons also in this book. And around the same time, we see in 1975, United Nations had declared International Women's uh, Year and the decade 75 to 85, International Women's Decade. So internationally, many activities were going on and this book comes at around the same time and this was a period of second wave of feminism which was flourishing in countries of West, uh, Western Europe and uh, North America. So combined effect of all these uh, movements, the efforts by the United Nations and the book by Easter Boost Boaster, Women's Role in Economic Development. All these pointed towards uh, uh, a situation that what we are considering uh, women to be benefited from the development, the word should be development, is not the development of women. So what should be uh, the process for development of women? So, uh, and if we see uh, the book which had, in fact the book by uh, Easter Bozo highlighted certain points and it took challenge the perception that uh, uh, benefits of development will trickle down to women. What uh, it said, it said that gender is a basic factor in division of labor. Second point raised by the book was women's labor at home and on farm are generally underreported and uh, she studies different uh, farming systems and uh, tries to state the reasons <coughs> of this uh, difference. Then uh, she also highlights that participation of women in off-farm employment uh, in fact leads to under uh, participation of women in economic activities. So all these act, uh, points raised by the book uh, led to the development of a new perspective that we do as women in development perspective. And, uh, Women in development perspective uh, was basically developed by uh, it has it uh, has the influence of liberal feminists and a group of liberal feminists loosely knit group we can say uh, of America under the name under the title WID started focusing on the concerns of women and started pressurizing the U.S. government to allocate funds for women specifically so that development activities for women can be taken up. So now what happened? The WIT perspective started focusing on the integration <coughs> of women in various development uh, projects. As a result, we see multiple projects uh, and these projects were basically income generating projects. Uh, these, all these projects started integrating women so that some income can be generated by women and uh, this was termed as women in development. 
So the focus here was on integration of women uh, in various development projects under the WIT perspective. So it was a kind of deliberate strategy to bring attention to women and then uh, it also focused on strategies to reduce discrimination against women and as a result of WIT perspective we see that women were integrated into various development activities especially income earning projects and uh, the best bit perspective which, which succeeded to certain level was criticized vehemently on certain grounds. One of the grounds was that it treated women as a homogeneous category and it ignored the intersectionality that it would, would have uh, that it should have taken into account. So avoiding intersectionality and treating women as a homogeneous category was one of the uh, basic criticism of bit perspective and then we see that uh, basically uh, the questions which uh, should have been raised were not raised by the bit perspective like uh, what are the sources of uh, the subordination and uh, secondary status of poor women, what is the nature of women's subordination and uh, why they are suffering. <laughs> These kind of questions were not raised by the WIT perspective and but we see that uh, the WIT perspective to a great extent <coughs> recalibrated development how from welfare to it, uh, it moved towards uh, integration of women into income generation activities. Earlier it was only uh, welfare. Like suppose I think that you need a sewing machine, I would provide you a sewing machine. At uh, this level, women were in integrated into develop, uh, income generation uh, activities. Around the same time, uh, due to, under the influence of neo-Marxism, we see another perspective developing that is known as women and development perspective. <coughs> the perspective did not last long because uh, it had all the weaknesses of women in development perspective and uh, <coughs> other weaknesses as well. So we rarely uh, talk about women and development though the term is there and uh, it was used once upon a time. So for women and development perspective also um, was there that focused mainly on analyzing women's subordination within the structures of international dependency and class inequality and as I uh, shared that uh, due to the shortcomings of uh, the bad perspective it was a uh, short-lived perspective uh, in the field of women, gender and development. Then in uh, mid 1980s, we see another perspective uh, coming in focus that was gender and development perspective because by then gender had become one important uh, focus of development activities. We were considering gender in the uh, area of environment also, in the area of development also and uh, due to the efforts of uh, uh, Vandana Shiva at the uh, first world conference uh, on women organized by U United Nations, she, she had somewhere succeeded in establishing that yes, women can play a major role in environment uh, which is a part of development. So gender and development perspective we see uh, coming into focus and before that I would like to say how that perspective recalibrated development from integration it uh, shifted to women only projects because women one of the criticism of a bit perspective was that it only integrated women into existing projects so we need and it did not succeed so we need women only projects so it was a kind of swimming pool which was which was created only for women to learn swimming and they were left in that pool and whether you can swim or not it had its own disadvantages but uh, and that's the reason it lasted very uh, for very short period so again it recalibrated development from the perspective of women now coming to uh, we have already been talking about uh, gad and for the first time uh, in the discourse on women and development we see focus shifting to gender relations uh, the patriarchy was also the focus and how 
gender is socially and culturally constructed and how gender relations affect the behavior of men and women in society because of being socially and culturally constructed. This was the focus of GAD and why and, uh, women are not able to participate fully in developmental activities and uh, this was again one of the perspectives uh, which focused on intersectionality. We have uh, discussed how the previous perspectives treated women as a homogeneous category and this was the perspective uh, which corrected itself and the, now the focus was on intersectionality and uh, it also tried to inquire certain questions which were, were raised by the uh, WID uh, proponents like what are the natures of uh, uh, sufferings of women, uh, why the roots, the causes of uh, the inferior status of women, all these were the concerns of uh, GAD perspective. And uh, basically, the GAD approach uh, uh, did not lend itself to integration into ongoing development strategies or, and programs. It demanded certain degree of commitment to a structural change as well, so that women are benefited. So, uh, it somewhere contributed to the recognition of men and women and uh, moving forward other gender also into the process of development. So, uh, this perspective again recalibrated development from the point of view of women because it, uh, its focus was on gender relations, not on women per se, and then it viewed women. Earlier women were viewed as a passive recipient of development initiatives. For the first time, women were viewed as active, uh, in fact, uh, actors in the process of development and the agency of women was recognized by the GAT perspective and somewhere it was holistic in nature so uh, and it also proposed that women should organize themselves into uh, self organizations the origination of uh, self help groups can be traced to this uh, particular uh, opinion of GAT perspective uh, and they believe that to gain political power, economic uh, justice, it is important to combine and come together. So, uh, that perspective also had shortcomings. How much time do I have? Just four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, I'll wind up in four minutes. So, what I was saying that uh, gap perspective was also criticized. Uh, though it uh, focused on intersectionality, but somewhere it ignored the women from the global south and treated their experience, which has happened with the second wave of feminism also, and that's the reason we see uh, after postmodernism, third wave of femen uh, feminism coming out with focus on local uh, and third world women. So this was again one of the criticisms. So third world women were homogenized and treated as victims of their own cultures uh, and it negated their agency. So uh, this was the strongest criticism of GAD and, uh, and it also, uh, the critics in fact of GAD, they argued that uh, the subordinate position of women uh, in society is a consequence of colonial and post-colonial exploitation rather than their own cultural uh, scenario, uh, in fact the culture of the third world country. So there have been then uh, trends, uh, other trends also post GAD era where uh, various things and various elements have been incorporated into the, this discourse on, on gender and development which I cannot take at this point. Uh, however, uh, when we talk about women and uh, recalibrating uh, development for uh, uh, gender justice, one thing is, thing is important that uh, achieving gender equality is one of the first steps to uh, recalibrate uh, development if we are talking about women. And the efforts have the on gender of, about uh, gender equality, we have been witness to all the efforts which uh, have taken place internationally, nationally, beginning with uh, Human Rights Charter of 1948. This 
was the first document which used gender neutral document. Then recognizing every uh, issue is women's issue. Women's rights are human rights. Beijing Declaration Forward Looking Strategy, Millennium Development Goals, uh, then now Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, adoption of CEDAW, uh, Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Attempts are on to achieve gender equality and if we are not uh, uh, at that point, and we are still trying because uh, Sustainable Development Goals indicates gender equality concerns to all the 17 goals and this is one of the major focus of sustainable development goals. Will we uh, be in a position to achieve complete gender equality that uh, is a thing which for which we have to wait for some more time and if we quote Emma Watson who launched the he for she movement, she says that to achieve complete gender equality, we, in fact she says that we won't be in a position to see a scenario where we achieve complete gender equality in our lifetime and then global gender gap index which was released by, uh, which was released recently says that uh, at the current pace of development gender equality will take 75 years to achieve and in South Asian countries it will take 50 more years uh, if we are moving at the current pace. So I will just wind up with uh, a quotation from Pearson and Jackson, uh, no sorry, Andrea Cornwall, <coughs> Elizabeth Beth Harrison and Anna Whiteland. Uh, in their introduction to repositioning feminism in gender and development they have written and I will quote, uh, gender is now well established in development discourse but the extent of change in women's lives does not match this discursive in a landslide. For many gender and development advocates, it appears that more women and poverty are equated in development discourse, the more uh, many women experience entrenched poverty. The more gender is mainstream, the less we find effective gender equality policies within key policy spaces and documents. Represented to technocrats and policymakers in the form of tools, frameworks, and mechanisms, gender appears as neutralized of political intent, diluted, denatured, depoliticized, included everywhere. As an afterthought, gender has become something everyone knows about that they are supposed to do something about. One bureaucrat summed it up when it comes to gender. Everyone size. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> Professor Swetha Prasad, uh, for make, making a comprehensive overview of the contours of uh, development uh, perspectives, various perspectives on gender. And you have very beautifully tried to narrate how, you know, and in what way we can recalibrate development from the perspective. From the perspective uh, of gender, so friends, uh, uh, we always talk about inclusive development. We always talk about sustainable development. But can we ever thought about that uh, sustainability or you know inclusiveness can ever be attained if we consider only the main folk of the society by you know uh, neglecting the fairer sex from the society's developmental affairs? Whether we'll be able to achieve the hundred percent efficiency, 100% goals of which, you know, we have set in, into sustainable development goals and so many other goals which we have uh, time and again set forth for achieving of self-reliance on different parts of the world into the context of global warming also in the context of, you know, sustainable development also. It is not possible. Uh, Professor Swetha Prasad has very beautifully explained the contours of the evolution of different perspectives on gender development and she beautifully narrates the big perspective and the gap perspective. But my question is that only by addressing the question of uh, uh, the fairer sex, whether we'll be able to go for inclusive development or sustainable development, I think we need to also address the problems of the third sex also, the third gender. They also need attention from us and uh, it's a good sign that uh, very recently we have started talking about the third gender also and in so many you know government gadgets and so many government documents and in, even in admission uh, browser also you can see uh, the columns are emerging wherein you, you have the option to write that also. So I think uh, 
fair and equitable society can only be attained if we try to address the gender issue. I think the issue of gender itself is problematic. The moment we talk about gender, that means down the line we are doing certain kind of discrimination. And it is against the ethos, it is against the belief and it is against the thought of gender justice. If we want to have a just society, a society in which all of us should be equal. The problem with Indian society or any other society is that uh, for the first and uh, foremost uh, aspect of any society is that it was all feudal in nature. If we see the origin and uh, evolution of the history of humankind on this, we passed from feudal society to capitalist society. And the feudalism was very much biased in favor of the main four. And apart from that, you see our cultural tradition, our customs, you know, our, our religious beliefs and practices, all they are favoring towards, you know, certain sections of the society, either it be uh, gendered or it be from caste based or if you, you can take any other, uh, other dominant section of the society. So that kind of uh, uh, viewpoint, if we still persist in the 21st century, I think the reason, the, the motto of establishing equality in the society will not be able to attain. Even though Professor Swetha Prasad has mentioned that so many schemes have been lost at the global level, at the national level, and she talked about, you know, sustainable development goals in which 17 goals have been set forth, in which women were the center of, uh, of, of all those schemes, you know. But, but it can only practically be possible to make it 100% success uh, if we change our mindset, our cultural practices, our customary practices, without changing those notions, you know, which, which is having, you know, age-old, you know, barriers on our society will not be able to come out of the cycles of this, you know, the mentality, the mindset that needs to be changed. Otherwise, you know, uh, the, 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 the vision of the uh, mantras of, you know, equality, equality in the society or equitarian society will not be possible. So I think uh, what Professor Swetha Prasad has narrated right now, it was it was a kind of, you know, a lesson to all our young scholars, especially those who are working in the area of gender. Now, with these words, I invite Professor Somajit Matra because he has to go. Can I, can I ask one question to After that, after that. Uh, I'll invite Professor Somajit Matra to uh, uh, give 10 minutes lecture and after that we'll have uh, question and answer session from both the presenters. So, we have uh, one minute. We have forgotten to invite Professor Sanjeev Mitha. Please come to the dais. Yes, Professor Patra, please. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, good morning, till now. Thank you, Professor. 10 minutes. Money Professor money. Master, 10 minutes. So it's yes. 11.52 and finish it by 12.05. So sorry. So sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor Manish Varma, my friend, Shoda Beer, Anand Beer, Professor Sheta Prashad, and students. Uh, at first, I will tell you, don't take development as something like paracetamol, calcon, which you go to the medicine shop, if you feel feverish and have it to cure that fever. Why I am telling this thing? For long period of time, decades of time, thought that development is a medicine to backwardness and something like that. Why I am telling this? Once I ask my students that if you have enough money in your hand and you want to do something for the villagers, what you will do? 
there are almost 40, 50 students in the class and everyone asked me that, that we want to develop the village. This is a kind of medicine we have in our hand for the villagers. Then I asked, please clarify what you actually want to do. Someone said that we construct road if I have enough money. Someone said I will construct, I will uh, electrify the village. And fortunately, none of them have said that I will construct a tunnel. You know, for the last 17 days, 41 I call development warriors. They suffered a lot, struggling their life in Uttar Kashmir. Just a few hours back, till now they are struggling for their life. So, there is a view. Actually, I am doing a crit critique of you know, development. There is a view that who is the beneficiary of development? It is a question of million dollars. It is sometimes said that development is good, very good. Development is very good for the outsiders. It is a delight for the outsiders and distress for the insiders. For example, if you find a beautiful flyover on a road, just imagine who is happy with that? Are the laborers? Are the local people? Are the local shopkeepers? Bus drivers? Who will be forced not to take the flyover? Who are the happy? In 2008, one British anthropologist named Thing he has coined a very interesting term, happiness regime. And he requested all of us to evaluate development projects in terms of happiness. Who are happy with development projects? Professor Koshad was talking about beneficiaries. It's a million dollar question again. Who are the beneficiaries of the development projects? When I was preparing a lecture on this development with dignity, I was fine. I found one book written by Sami Amin, you know the name. The title of the book is <coughs> Man Development. And the subtitle is more interesting. Anatomy of a Global Failure. Sami Amin observed that during 60s, Development became a medicine for all third world countries. But the book, book was written in 1990s. But in 1990s, the experiences of 1990s were very, very, very unhappy. And Swaminarayan writes, I am just putting one line. Development has broken down. Its theory is in crisis. Its ideology subject of doubt and a big exclamation note is given by Shankarabhi. You'll be, you all know, right, that classical sociologists never talked about development. Neither Pope, nor Weber, nor Dukai. They were interested in enlightenment. They were interested in social change, rationalization, something like that. That is, they were more interested in social change of Western Europe and how Western Europe faced, you know, modern It is only a very, very notorious kind of lecture given by Harry Truman of President of America. It was given in 20th January 1949. And during that, during his lecture, he used the term development for the first time. And development era started. We started thinking development as what I said, paracetamol of fever. So, 
the, the side effects. There are so central effects of development, side effects also. The side effects of development were seen during 1970s. This is again an observation of Samir Amin. That development means displa displacement. Development means ecological degradation. <coughs> uh, just yesterday, Professor Varma is, a, is an expert of that field. Development means discrimination. And development means for the warriors of Uttar Kashi, development means death. They are struggling for their death. And the promise was given that if we can complete the tunnel, the entire socio-economic profile of that Uttar Kashi will be changed at the cost of 41 lives. Looking at this side of development, Siv Vishwanathan has said that development is nothing but terrorism. Development is nothing but terrorism. Another finding is given by Rajni Kotan. It is more interesting. He said, British has gone. <coughs> Colonialism has gone. Development took over. For India, we got independence in 1947. And we started talking about development from 1949. So development has gone. Colonialism has is ended. Development capitalism was started. Why are you preparing? For this, I will take two minutes more. When I was preparing for this seminar, Development in Dignity, I sought the meaning of development, uh, meaning of, you know, dignity. And Oxford Dignity Dictionary defines in terms of it, uh, dignity in terms of respect. So two major criticisms of development discourse is, first, it is Eurocentric. Europe considered them, Julius Fabian has termed a very interesting phrase, contemporary ancestors. <coughs> contemporary ancestors. You understand the meaning, how derogatory it is. And another one is, it is Overfield anthropocentric. Can't we be a bit respectful towards our plants, animals when we execute development projects? Can't we be a bit respectful towards people's aspirations? Can't we be a bit respectful towards people's autonomy, cultural autonomy, individual autonomy? So if we can do that, I request the Department of Sociology at Bardwell University in coming future, I do not know when, to organize another seminar on, not on development with dignity, but on dignity in development. Instead of dignity with development, we should think about dignity in development. Last slide. The difference is huge. And you can take a few hint from a difference made by Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. He has talked about this is for the philosophers. He has talked about the difference between knowing jhana and knowing about. This is the difference like that. Thank you very much. Amen. You rightly mentioned that development is a contested topic. What would be the development? Why development? 
where to develop, how to develop, and most importantly, who's developing. That are very, very, you know, basic and very, very perennial question that needs to be addressed in a proper way if ever we want to evolve a mechanism to understand development. And there are various viewpoints. You see, uh, in my in, in my uh, keynote address last day, I was talking about uh, development as a uh, Professor Yoginder Singh called it as a, a situation of crisis of success. And I also tried to quote Professor T.K. Omen. Uh, 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 he calls development as uh, cognitive blackout and, 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 and says that uh, we are deliberately ignoring the rights of the marginal communities and disprivileged communities while evolving, while formulating the policies on development. So that cognitive blackout, the notion of cognitive black, blackout that needs to be addressed proper way if ever we want to evolve a comprehensive development model. And I also quoted last evening, last morning, uh, John Niederwin. He, he, uh, he, has, he has asked a very perennial question that whether our development paradigm has failed or do, do we need to have a development alternative. If our existing development paradigm is not able to address the basic and the perennial question, then we need to evolve certain different and ultimately different kind of parameter through which you know we can address these basic issues of the marginal and ex excluded uh, 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 community stakeholders who are also having the same kind of rights on this on, 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 on the on the goods of this uh, and the resources of this uh, universe and the galaxy and the country like we are enjoying so that that, that is the mo most important thing which we need to address while talking about development with dignity Actually, uh, uh, we have two more presentations today. Uh, one is from uh, Professor Siddharth Mitra and another one is from Professor uh, Sanjeev Mridha. My esteemed colleagues on the dais and of the dais and all the research scholars and the delegates, ladies and gentlemen present in this room. So, my topic is to present human development with dignity, the psychosocial perspective. So in this two days seminar, we have come to know and understand human development and dignity from different aspects and different angles. So I should not confine my talk on particularly on what development is and the ins and outs and the detail of people. So, good life is everybody's necessity and it is a quest for man, whether it is individually or collectively. And if we see what does it mean by good life, we can explain this need or quest from a very holistic perspective, that is the biopsychosocial aspect of a man. The biology essentially talks about the biological phenomena, genetic considerations, physiological considerations and many more under the domain of science. Sociology, man, society and interaction with the social institutions. The psychology, it deals with the cognitive aspect and thought processes of an individual. So, the total man, it is the outcome, it happens with a very developmental journey as because whenever human baby borns, it is our social and it is like another animal being. But over the period of time, socialization of the person takes place. Here, the biological predisposition is there. And with the interaction with the environment and the social institutions, the person develops the social construct and understanding of dignity of the individual. So, dignity is essentially 
biologically derived and interaction with the society and how an individual constructs society from different perspectives. In the domain intermingling, we understand the psychosocial aspect of an individual. So there are essentially nearly 10 major aspects through which we can understand the psychosocial aspect of man for the dignity and development of live with dignity which a person develops having some relationship with the values like the core values you know the five core values we do have or we have figured out those things are the truth right action peace non-violence and love without this the dignity cannot be achieved and dignity of the and of the individual cannot be understood and cannot be the dignity to others to be contributed reciprocally by an individual what he thinks wants to get and to offer to other persons with whom a person interacts throughout life cannot be happen without understanding and without adhering these five core values of human being. So, in this way, human values are very relationship with dignity. And in uh, dignity is has been mentioned in the law, in moral perspective, and in other perspective also. In Article 21 of our Constitution, talks about and it has given the detail and about the human dignity and the freedom of life. The psychosocial aspect. To be very precise, it depends upon mainly the social cognition. What a person understands, the cognition particularly we can think, thinking, imagination, perceiving, these are the cognitive ability. So these cognitive abilities in the context of the society and the social institutions and different groups. So, uh, the potential, there are some potential errors in making social cognitions. Some, are, some of them are the negativity bias, that means we take the negative things easily than the positive things. Optimistic bias, that means we think that it will, it will making, uh, make me happen by luck or any other some uh, influenced by supernatural powers or any other god man like that. And another thing is that thought suppression. The many of the time, uh, many of the times, as my experience, whenever we ask questions from the youngsters and the students, they do not ask questions because our particular society doesn't accept question, or the students do not ask normally the questions to the persons who are the authority in that particular field of knowledge. So this, this is a huge gap of interacting with the people and to, okay, I will conclude, and to open up one's mind and the thinking ability, the hugely, huge potential, the person is having huge potential and energy at the time of his or her twenties. But that time he or she is in the class or with other persons he is or she is silent or taking part as a passive learner. So in this fashion the cognitive and thinking process do not evolve in the individual. This is the thing and the other things are there. I can say that the attitudes are very important, the stereotyping prejudice due to prejudice and discriminations are there as nicely our uh, chairman was mentioning uh, whenever he was summing up madam's lecture. So, and the relationships are very important. Good relationships are very important. Social influence is very important, changing others' behavior and one's own behavior also. And in the other context, the that is aggression. We used to face with different aggression or aggression-like situations and some kind of aggression is very necessary. 
Otherwise, the person having no aggression or huge aggression, this is not, not a very good healthy sign of the mental health of the individual. And the other very important thing is the social groups. It depends upon the dignity of the individual in which group does the person belong. That is very important. And to conclude this, to live with dignity and to manifest the potentiality of an individual to the fullest, one's journey from the animal child to the social man, it requires to develop and to control one's eat and to develop the strengthening the ego, the rational component of the individual so that a person can handle different situations of his or her own. That is the self-made <coughs> person. One needs to become through the interaction in the society. And in this fashion, a person without hurting others' identity, without hurting, without devaluing the others' differences or the following the equanimity principle can dignity be ensured by an individual and it could be reciprocated to the society and vice versa. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Medaji, uh, for making a psychosocial perspective on uh, human development and dignity. Then you discuss that dignity is a biologically derived concept and it is socially constructed as well and how social psychological aspects are responsible for the construction of you know uh, 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 dignity of an individual in the society and also responsible for the development in the society and he talked about five very important values which he thinks is very important for the development of uh, good personality, with, uh, such a personality which is socially constructed and having psychological uh, routine also and with uh, things about dignity also. So uh, it was his presentation and now with this I invite the last presentation, uh, presenter of today's session, Professor Siddharth Mitra Sahar and I will request him to confine his presentation just within 10 minutes because we are getting late and it's, uh, it's 12.18 so uh, I'll request you to complete by 12.28 because at 12.30 we have to leave. Hello. Then we can leave in between them. <coughs> <coughs> Even if you see this, uh, there is no problem. Mm -hmm. Other mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that is that uh, mm -hmm. But we have to move. I will let people leave. We don't mind. It's necessary. I will get it. All right. Yes. Okay. So, how much time can I take? If you want to take more time, then uh, I, I, I'm leaving you then here now. So, we can leave. So we can have five minutes to talk to our friends. How much, how much time? No, I don't. It would be better if you take over right now. So it would be better for, for you also and for us also. So uh, thank you very much friends. I am sorry that because of paucity of time I am not able to stay here for further. We had three very important presentations. One was uh, talking about the gender. Another one was talking about, you know, uh, questioning the development, you know, uh, paradigm of our society. And third one was, you know, I was trying to touch uh, Professor Anirban. And, and sorry, Professor. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Okay. One, one, one minute. Yeah. I, I thank Professor Monish Varma and Professor Shita Prashad for devoting so much time to us in this seminar. Uh, we know that they are very busy with the ISS election. Even then, they have come and uh, they have given Sir. us time. Sir. For this, we are very really grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, sir, sir.
I know that certain prominent personalities have come out with, you know, their struggles with mental disorders. We can think of, uh, you know, Anushka Sharma, for example, okay, um, other people, okay, Virat Kohli has, has come out with his uh, problems with mental health and that reduces the stigma associated with it. But what I am going to talk about is timely prevention and cure of mental disorders. Because if you cure mental disorders in a timely manner, the person concerned is able to make a contribution to the community and maintain its dignity. Okay? And this is where I have my presentation, which you will not be able to see. Okay? So, if you look at the WHO definition of mental health, it says that if a person is mentally healthy, he is able to cope with life's stresses, okay, the pressure that life offers you from time to time, okay. The person is able to learn well and work well and make a contribution to the community. What do I mean by learning well and working well? It is meant that, you know, I can soak up education well so that I can induce a process of human capital formation in myself and working well means I am being productive okay so obviously a person with mental disorder will not meet this definition okay now mental health can also lead to poor physical health okay for example Mental disorders have been found to be predictors of diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Okay? So, no wonder that WHO has called mental disorders, or oh sorry, WHO has called uh, mental health uh, a basic human right. Okay? Now, then you must say that why am I, why is my topic mental health and economic development? After all, you know, we are growing economically. Almost all developing countries are experiencing an increase in per capita income. But the problem is, while they are experiencing an increase in per capita income, the proportion of people with mental disorders and therefore able to live a life with dignity is also increasing. Okay? Therefore, economic growth does not translate into development with dignity. Okay? And there is a lot of literature by Gupta et al. and Yu and Wang which says that economic growth is usually associated with urbanization and industrialization. What does that do? That increases inequality, that increases competition, and that releases the polluters of greed and envy, okay, which are bad for mental health and which can trigger the genetic predisposition positions of people to have mental disorders okay now the other thing is that economic <coughs> growth often does not reduce poverty to the desirable extent even now in India we have 13 percent of the population below the poverty line first of all it is important to realize that Mental health burns a hole in one's pocket. Studies show that people spend around one-fifth of their income on health if they have a mentally ill person in the family. Okay? 
if that is so, mental disorders can cause families to fall below the poverty line. Poverty in turn is associated with trauma and that can give rise to mental disorders. So there is a negative synergy between mental health and, and poverty. Okay. Now, what I have said is that mental disorders prevent people from living a life with dignity. But why am I presenting this lecture on mental health and economic development? Are mental disorders very important? Okay. They are. First of all, there are three types of losses, welfare losses occurring from the incidence of mental disorders, trauma, productivity loss and loss of human capital and the mentioned negative synergy with poverty. Okay, negative synergy of mental disorders with poverty. And if you look at statistics, countrywide statistics and global statistics, the proportion of the world's population afflicted with mental disorders is at this given point of time is 12.5%. In the US it's 19%. In India it's 14.3%. In China it's 16.6%. Okay. So in a sense therefore restoring the dignity of people with mental disorders is very important. Number one is you can prevent it to the extent you can you should prevent it and secondly you should cure mental disorders or manage mental disorders so that people can be a part of the productive portion of the population and if people are a productive portion of the population, part of the productive portion of the population they can hold their heads high with dignity. Okay, now if, if you look at determinants of mental health outcomes, this is very important before I come to the policy recommendations, okay, with which I will conclude. Let me just see. Okay, yeah. So, so if you look at the determinants of mental health outcomes at the level of the family or individual, they are poverty, social and emotional skills, genetics and nurture. Okay. Genetics you cannot do anything about. Okay. You are born with your genes. Okay. Remember you have a person who can have genetic predispositions towards an illness, but there are certain precipitating factors which can trigger off mental illness, for example, stress. Okay. Or a bad family life or something like that. Okay. Now, nurture is how your parents bring you up. It could also be self-nurture. You know, how, how you nourish yourself. And if you... You have to realize that sometimes nurture reinforces genetics. The nurture by your parents depends on the genes that your parents have. Okay. Poverty and mental health I have already talked about. Then social and emotional skills. Here I should talk about this term called metacognition. Metacognition is thinking about thinking. Okay. Suppose a person has done very well in his, in his exams. He goes back home and he tells his mother that mother I have done very well, I have got 90% and all that. His mother is watching a movie, mother doesn't react because she is so engrossed in the film. Okay, now the, the person feels hurt, the boy or girl feels hurt, she might suddenly hit back at the mother and say you are so selfish, you are not even congratulating me. Or she might understand through emotional maturity that it's not her fault, she is just absorbed in the, the movie which is happening and that, you know, he will tell her at a later stage. This tells you that you have the freedom to 
respond to your feelings, okay? You have various choices. And somehow, I think that these social and emotional skills can be taught to the individual. Because otherwise, suppose the boy had hit out at the mother, the mother would have again hit out at the boy, and a quarrel would have happened, and this can be mental, this can diminish mental health. Okay, if you suppose it happens, such, such things happen on a daily basis. Okay, now there are certain other factors which determine mental health at the level of the community. Inequality I have talked about, violence, attitude towards women. Okay, in general if the attitude towards women leads to an exploitative relationship, that would mean lower mental health on the part of women. Okay, yeah, usually is the dominated sex which suffers from poor mental health. Okay, then at the level of the nation, okay, recessions. Suddenly everybody's income is going down. This leads to gloom. Okay, disease outbreaks, COVID, nobody is able to go outside the house. That leads to poor mental health. And the growing climate crisis which leads to climate refugees. Okay. Now I come to the concluding part of the lecture having learnt all this. What are the policy recommendations that can be made? Okay. One is as I said that there is a negative synergy between poverty and mental. We have 0 0.75 psychiatrists per lack of population whereas the, the WHO norm is 3. A large number of states have a 90% deficit in psych psychiatrists. So all that I am saying is why don't you, you know, you are generating more tax revenues because of economic growth, channelize it to increase the spread of psychiatrists, okay? So that real economic development can occur, okay? Now the third policy recommendation is make parents more educated about parenting okay make so you have studies which say that parents who are affectionate will give rise to emotionally secure children okay parents who are affectionate and want parents who are cold okay or do not pay any attention to their children will lead, give rise to emotionally insecure children Okay, then we talked about metacognition. Okay, parents need to teach the art of metacognition to ch children. Okay, if parent, parenting is just not about producing children. Okay, so what I recommend is that at the age of 21, probably every adult should undergo a compulsory course in parenting telling them about how the future children's, children's health would be affected by their own behavior. Okay, now I end with just two more points, making neighborhoods safe and less violent, that's also necessary for good mental health, and tackling recessions, disease outbreaks and climate change. Okay, this is all that I have. Thank you very much. Now I invite our next speaker of the session, Professor Amitesh Mukhopadhyay. Sir, I have not phone tied to Sajarakta. Phone tied to Nawajachi. It is an Awajachi. Professor Amitesh Mukhopadhyay will speak on environment and ensuring development with dignity. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, at the outset, I must put on record my sincere thanks to uh, the Department of Sociology in Bordhaman, uh, a place to which I belonged at some point of time. I decided to come almost once in every week. Uh, to take classes, but in the old building, which I identified much with the sociology department, but a lot has changed <coughs> once again, thanks to the development within the university itself. Uh, 
Uh, my thanks goes to Professor Onirban Manerji for this very warm invite to this seminar and to all those in the Department of Sociology uh, for their very uh, kind and the warmth with the shower. Uh, and also with a note of an apology at the very outset that I, I was supposed to come at 11.15 for this session. But it is also because of development, uh, which had been happening along the entire stretch uh, beyond all seat. And then I took a detour. But even then, <coughs> development uh, came as a major obstacle at some point beyond Shoktigar. And eventually, I could find my way to Bordeaux University. But uh, my sincere apologies for that as well, that I kept you all who have been uh, waiting in the past session and uh, it must have caused enormous inconvenience to the uh, organizers of the conference and therefore I uh, deeply apologize for this. Uh, my topic that I thought I would speak on was once again keeping in mind the broad thematic of this uh, conference that is development with dignity and I was trying to think of connecting it to a place uh, where I've been working for the last 20-21 years which is that of the Sundarbans Delta in West Bengal. There's a place where I've been working uh, for, for the last many years and uh, I've come to that but uh, the topic goes like this, but the, the title of this today's uh, talk that in search of uh, development with dignity, uh, a technocratic solution to climate change and the voices of the people from the Sundarbans Delta, uh, which is that of the Bengal Delta as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, when I <clears throat> came to know that I, that this seminar is going to be on development with dignity, I was reminded uh, of a very uh, old book that I read long back, uh, which is by Mark Hover, the Anthropological Critique of Development. And one of the lines which struck me at the very outset, in the, when you flip through the pages of the book, the very first page strikes you is that <clears throat> he suggests that development is probably the way in which the relation that we have around the world is constituted and the way in which we understand who the developed are, who the developing are, which is the global south, which is global north, uh, the way in which we understand the globe as being populated by different people uh, as we move from the, from the east to the west, from north to the south. And this is what has become a very uh, strong and a very uh, emotive term which had been coined post Second World War uh, as being expressive of the way in which uh, the countries which were colonized for long and the countries which had colonized them for long would be operating their life and biography in a sense and therefore uh, it had achieved a sense of certainty in the whole imaginary of our ways of how we look at uh, uh, national development, national planning, uh, the biography of a nation, how it's going to uh, steer its uh, path towards uh, self-determination, glory, progress, uh, which once characterized colonial uh, ambitions eventually translated into something which probably the post-World War um, people at Helmand Affairs thought that it would be much more benign term uh, compared to the way in which civilizational inequalities were framed in the earlier occasion. And therefore development was thought to be a, a kind of a, a word with much of its innocence, but as it unfolds and the career of these new nations as it had unfolded, uh, development eventually became a very significant term, describing will to the way in which power has been shaped in making these nations possible. 
and therefore development had actually undergone it many of us, you know, many self-expressions. At one point, we had idea of development which was understood as being a transfer of all that was good from the developed nation to the underdeveloped, developing, uh, decolonizing, and therefore one of the chief ideas that governed and permeated was that of uh, economic development, uh, modernization, model much as it were on the path that West were to follow and eventually uh, that led to success and therefore that was a kind of a model. And it's different forms, different expressions such as the prefix, economic development, uh, industrial development, uh, agricultural development, uh, all these prefixes uh, govern the, the fate and the, and the path of the nations which became independent following the Second World War. And it continued until we reached a point where every prefix that came to be associated with this word eventually generated its own self pity And development constantly put itself through a scanner whereby it got critic, criticized, and became something which the earlier it was not. And what remained central was the idea of development, that one development might fail, but eventually that would lead to another development. And therefore I suggest that it was a kind of a uh, conceptual certainty with which we operate. And therefore when um, the era of economic, industrial, etc. of all this development um, uh, came under the scanner, we had the new prefix which is that of the sustainable development which uh, once again <clears throat> uh, brought to light a lot of criticisms that once uh, were associated with the idea of development which was once thought of its hallmark suddenly found to be its obstacle. And this is where I situate uh, much of this uh, ambition of, of a country like India that uh, uh, it is perhaps because of uh, the sustainability as the new prefix to development, we had seen certain ways in which development became a highly contestational area. You know, if you look at uh, the beginning of this uh, new nations, almost at the threshold of their independence in 1950s, then you find that United Nations <coughs> is coming out with its own charter whereby they are setting out a path of development and where they are suggesting that it's going to be the modernization model of economic development whereby uh, all the different parochial pockets of unreason which might have survived in caste, might have survived in tribe, might have survived in different uh, communitarian identities, different pockets of unreason, they have to be burst uh, to allow for this new development to take place which is that of the modern development, embarking and partaking of an industrial path towards its glory and therefore everything that might come in its way as an obstacle in the form of unreason must be eliminated in order for this development to take place. This was in 1950, if you look at United Nations Development Charter for the so-called underdeveloped countries of India which means that all communitarian, local identities are to be understood as pockets of unreason and therefore they need to be eliminated in order for development to take place. And exactly 40 years later, United Nations <coughs> stands almost back on its head, uh, suggesting in one of its, I know, art summits, which was one of the first of its kind in Rio de Janeiro, after the United Nations <laughs> Commission for Environmental Development, that uh, all that they had said in 1950-51 is untrue and therefore they must revisit. And one of the conclusions that they drew uh, in favor of their new agenda was that the same communities, same pockets of unreason, same communities 
which might have been sites of all parochial practices. Uh, they are actually sites of immense uh, wisdom. Uh, so the community which in 1950 was supposed to be an obstacle to the path of development, the local people who were supposed to be path uh, obstacles to the path of development, now are celebrated as the only way in which development could survive. In other words, the local wisdom, indigenous knowledges, in which perhaps in 1950 the unreason might have thrived, is no longer there, because this is exactly the site which needs to be explored in all its possibilities to be able to celebrate development in its new avatar, which is the sustainability. In other words, uh, all the possibilities are locked up in nature, but it's absolutely one has to be careful in approaching and unlocking them. And in doing that, it is important that they must take into the confidence the same very people who were once castigated as being the outcast now are to be celebrated as the effective indigenous people who are trying to uh, motivate, trying to understand, uh, trying to apply all that they have as their indigenous knowledge to the possibilities of development. Now the question which remains still wide open is that what is this indigenous knowledge? Right? Uh, is it uh, something which is out there that people could go see and collect and you know, tend to apply that to the question of development? Uh, is it that uh, indigenous knowledge which was once thought of as an obstacle could be easily located, bereft of, emptied of all its shortcomings which earlier characterized its possible negative impact and effect? And therefore, there was a serious rethinking which went on uh, around this concept of what constitutes as indigenous. Because, how do you understand indigenous? Because one of the possible uh, problems which appear to sort of come to the surface is one, that in trying to understand indigenous knowledge, aren't we all trying to reconstitute or reconstruct certain elements of the tradition which we understand as Indian uh, which would be, could be used uh, without much of a qualification. In other words, what does it mean to, be, to go back to the tradition? Uh, does it mean that one has to go back to the caste inequalities that were part of the tradition? The way in which the women were uh, completely ignored, exploited, all this could be the part of tradition, that, that, that which are now being celebrated as traditional knowledge in the whole lexicon of sustainability. Uh, if that be the case, then one, should we actually understand Indian tradition and apply this almost unqualified, that should it be that the modernity and all its different impulses that came with the invocation of the word development, uh, would it be uh, effective in trying to sort of throw the baby with the bathwater, which is that of the modernity, and just em embracing tradition almost unqualified way. <coughs> the second question which became very significant, and therefore uh, one of the chief uh, arguments against indigenous knowledge was uh, that came from those who were looking at Indian tradition, that if it were to mean go back to the Indian tradition, then how far actually could one go back? And how much of it could be effectively taken and how much it could be actually left as though it was redundant? The other important question which became also part of this entire indigenous uh, discourse and the question of what constitutes as local knowledge, what constitutes as communitarian knowledge, what, uh, what counts as indigenous knowledge, is the whole idea of how we understand indigenous knowledge, something that I already stated. That is it that we understand indigenous knowledge using all that we know today, uh, more almost a kind of a hindsight, now that we have a modernity thriving and unfolding in a society which is India, and modernity in India is almost 200 years old, we all know that it started all with the onset of colonial rule, and what 
the ending was the colonial rule, but not the modernity. <coughs> so we are part of modernity, but of course the modernity emptied of its colonial rule. Therefore, the question is, with what lens do we understand indigenous knowledge? Is it that we are understand indigenous knowledge as we have learned them in the discourses of social sciences, how it has grown as indigenous knowledge, which means that one of the important ways in which we have learned and talked about indigenous knowledge is when we have learned to use the repertoire of modernity. That all that goes within modernity and how it has actually understood indigenous knowledge is the entire wherewithal, the knowledge, know-how that I have to understand indigenous knowledge. And therefore when I access indigenous knowledge, it is with that idea of modernity it is with the wherewithal of modernity that we try and understand indigenous knowledge. The question is then, how, if we try and understand indigenous knowledge, try to define it, try to classify it, try to sort of museumize it, try to protect it, then eventually we are turning it into something which indigenous knowledge is not. In other words, indigenous knowledge in terms of its fluidity, in terms of its you know, embeddedness in people's practices, the way in which people live their life, the way people actually, uh, you know, approach many of the problems which face them in their daily life and living, are the ways in which indigenous knowledge is understood. <coughs> and the moment we try and quintessentially define that, and try and understand, well, this is indigenous knowledge among this particular group of people in living in this particular locality, then we are trying to define it using all that we know as modern knowledge and the knowledge of science. And the moment we do that, does it remain indigenous knowledge? That became a very important question. And therefore, development once again remained very wide open that no matter how much of indigenous knowledge that you can actually put together, it still remains almost unclarified as to what constitutes indigenous knowledge of the people. Because if we see objects in the museum which are kept, you know, supposedly several <coughs> centuries old, we are showcasing them in the museum, putting them, taking care of them, using all the modern repertoire of how to basically preserve this particular specimen as relic of tradition, then what I'm trying to do is to translate that tradition in the language of modernity. And this is exactly what I'm trying to suggest when we talk so much about indigenous knowledge. One of the things that often comes across when we think of development with dignity, development which gives power to people, development as empowering, that one of the celebrated ideas that we often put forth is the idea of indigenous knowledge. That respect people's ideas, respect people's traditions, respect people's ways of doing things, and then actually you can achieve a lot of development. I am not against that, but I'm, I'm, I am not disagreeing, disagreeing with that either. All that I am trying to suggest, can I take this water? Yes, yes, yes. yes. All that I'm trying to suggest is that in our understanding, theorizing, accessing indigenous knowledge and making it a part of a policy imperative in, in, in the way in which sustainability discourse has expanded, enlarged our horizon of development, is that we are probably also not adequately explaining the question of what it means to actually to locate and access indigenous knowledge. And, I'm, and of course, Levi-Strauss is being taught in most of the sociology classes in the universities in India today. And one of the things that Levi-Strauss have often uh, discussed at length is the difference between a, uh, an engineer or a technocrat and a biocruller, right? The one who lives with this tradition and one who actually makes possible tradition. And if you look 
at this fundamental distinction, then the question keeps coming back to you as to what constitutes indigenous knowledge. And therefore, the question of people's rights, as we have witnessed today in India, under the, under the regime of sustainability discourse, is one of the things that keeps reminding us very importantly is what does it mean to work with indigenous knowledge? What does it mean to understand knowledges which are often born of a variety of practices which are often an occasion for understanding how modernity and tradition crisscrossed, how modernity and tradition entangled with each other in a manner in which we often seem almost that they are inseparable. And much that we have already understood as uh, people's rights, assertions, protest in different ways under this entire regime of sustainability discourse. You have Chico movement, which is one of the very important ways where sustainability came to the fore. And it is not surprised that in 1980, when Ramachandra, who was writing his book on social ecology, one of the things that is probably argues at the very outset that Chipko movement and Bhopal gas tragedy are the two significant ways in which environmental consciousness has become part of our public life today. And it is late, but better late than never. And apart from that, we have several other movements which simultaneously happening, you know, in different parts of India. Uh, on the one hand, you have these movements which are happening, uh, you know, uh, in, in the hills. Uh, you have the movements along the coastlines. You have also movements in, in support of preservation of the lakes against overfishing. And so whichever way and whichever direction you have the movements happening in the, in the mining belts of India where there has been a tremendous uproar against, uh, you know, corporate uh, inroads, commercial mining, uh, commercial logging. So, we are actually in the middle of an environmental discourse which, which articulates the question of dignity, which articulates and revisits the question of dignity in a sense in which uh, we are part of it. And such is the power of, uh, you know, power that is, that is employed in, in, in making certain imaginations possible about what development ought to be like. And <clears throat> this is, uh, I think, is a moment which we are living in and therefore one of the things that keeps coming to us is that what does it mean to follow the imperative of certain development, right? And it is against this that I am trying to put forth my very specific case which is that of the Sundarbans, primarily because uh, not that uh, <clears throat> uh, there has been no development in Sundarban, developments are happening much in the same way we see developments are happening along the entire streets that I traverse today to reach Bordhuan. Uh, <coughs> uh, Sundarban people have seen flyovers. Sundarban is a place which once in <coughs> 1990s people used to take almost six, seven hours to reach uh, Bashanti and uh, etc. But now they, they could reach that in three hours. Uh, so development has happened in Sundarbans. Uh, it is not that Sundarban is uh, outside the uh, language and the practice of development. I'm not saying that. But what I'm trying to say is that certain development actually poses certain problems, right? Uh, <clears throat> which is how we understand development. I mean, there's a very interesting book by uh, Farguson and Lesotho, you know, that was a work uh, which was, which he did in <coughs> Lesotho, uh, where Lesotho had become a very important center for developing initiatives by United Nations and different bilateral agencies, funding bodies. <clears throat> and he kind of said that a uh, number of developing initiatives have been unleashed in Lesotho uh, ever since this country was, uh, this country actually qualified for the attention by the development practitioners. But no matter how much of development has actually happened in Lesotho, each instance of development actually calls for a renewed uh, emphasis on the word development, that each development actually suggests the ways in which the earlier development was fraught with its problem, and therefore it needs more development, right? And, and I'm also trying to <coughs> sort of follow that line of an argument, 
uh, where by Sundarban is is a region uh, which is often contrary to our imagination that no development has happened. No development has happened. In fact, one of the one of the important ways in which because Sundarban became part of uh, the development lexicon is uh, when uh, you had a, a Sundarban development board in 1970s and it was absolutely lying dormant until in 1994 when there was a Sundarban Affairs Department was constituted and therefore one of the things that was mentioned in these uh, reports of the formation behind uh, or the rationale behind the formation of the Sundarban uh, Affairs Department was that this region has been uh, has not been given adequate attention. Uh, it is a region where there is this forest and the notorious Royal Bengal Tiger and the people's lives are not safe either and therefore this region needs more development. Which is which is one of the ways in which Sundarban was brought into the uh, brought into the uh, onto the orbit of development. <laughs> that a lot of development has to be uh, has to take place in Sundarbans to make life possible. And then uh, Sundarban, the other important imaginary which also happened uh, alongside in the development discourse on Sundarban is that this is also one of the most vulnerable places. This is a place where people's lives are not safe. This is a marginal environment and therefore uh, people live a life which is very risky, uh, safe, not safe, very unsafe. And therefore, people's livelihood invariably sort of brings them into all kinds of uh, uh, encounters which are not safe for human living. And therefore, this region could be best developed if left to grow as a natural wilderness, uh, a natural uh, site for the wildlife, and less and less for the human beings. In fact, this was, this was a kind of a debate which goes back in time to the colonial rule. Uh, when Sundarban had two distinct careers, two distinct biographies being shaped by colonial rule. If you look at the first hundred years, then you would find that the first hundred years, uh, like in most places, the colonial rule always thought of, uh, thought of forest and water as limiting. And limiting in the sense that they are possible obstacles to land formation. And therefore, if you have to have land, you need to actually reclaim forest and water. And which went on for almost uh, almost 100 years. If you carefully look at 1757 onwards, right up to 1857, there was a tremendous uh, effort behind Sundarban being reclaimed, uh, reclaimed, and and the way in which lands were given and lands were granted to people to invite people so that money people from Kolkata could come and stay there and have their land grants. But also the next hundred years also is something where you find uh, that the first hundred years have seen Sundarban as a kind of a wasteland which needs to be reclaimed in order to have human habitation. The subsequent hundred years uh, you find that the same Sundarban became a wasteland, but a wasteland which uh, was a forested wasteland and therefore by that time, by 1870s, 1880s, uh, colonial rule had also realized that the forest has become a very important uh, resource uh, from the point of view of colonial rule and the, that they wanted to rectify some of the mistakes they had committed already in the first hundred years. How much of time do I have? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So, uh, uh, that, they that they rectify some of their mistakes and they uh, thought that best way to conserve Sundarban is not to have any more human settlements in the Sundarban and therefore best is to let the, this, this area grow as a, as a forest whereby uh, you could have a delicate balance being struck between the demands of ecology and those of the humans. Right? Uh, this is largely replicated if you look at the career of Sundarban in the 70s onwards, largely replicated in the, in the development discourses of the government. Right. That this is a region where no more settlements would be would be allowed because this is part of the Forest Reserves Act, WWF site. But of course, this is also a home to about uh, five million people uh, whose lives are constantly under the threat of two kinds of disaster. One is the disasters that we often read in the newspapers. Right. Uh, if you look at this entire. Uh, 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 you know, look at this uh, state of Sundarban with, with this with this 
century, that is 2000, that in fact the Sundarban had been struck by a number of cyclones. As we move into the 2000, number of cyclones, big, small, but of course, severest of them being Cyclone Isla in 2009, and Amphal, which was in 2020. Uh, and the other important uh, uh, question which often uh, you know, human lives are confronted with is that of continuous imperceptible riverine erosion which often causes many of these embankments which surround these settled islands uh, to break, uh, causing saline ingress, uh, people remain flooded for, for days together and their lives slowly, gradually sort of crawl back as they do in order to find something of a settlement, something of a uh, safety amidst all kinds of vulnerabilities. But I'm, I'm trying to focus on the two disasters, and which is which is where I'm going to quickly, in the remaining five minutes, I'm going to quickly, uh, maybe four minutes. In the remaining four minutes, I'm going to quickly situate uh, the question of what I intend to say as the technocratic solution. Uh, that Cyclone Isla has caused, uh, which was very severe in Sundarbans in 2009, and it was a kind of an eye opener for many people in the Sundarbans. They thought that they probably would not be able to live in this island any longer. And they need to live because agriculture is not uh, possible. Because if you have the land being, you know, under saline water for, for at least two, three months, that is good enough to sort of, you know, prevent any further cultivation from happening in that particular land in the next three, four years. And therefore, uh, one of the realizations that dawned on people was that they must leave this land. And therefore people actually went in, in collective and, and post Isla surveys that were conducted in the Sundarbans and eventually there was a small little publication which also uh, came out in Bharnakula which suggested that most of the houses became so deserted that you would only find the uh, extremely aged people living there uh, and some of the family members of those who had left Sundarbans in search of war all over India. And the places they went to were Kolkata, Chennai, Bangalore, Delhi and obviously they got <coughs> uh, drawn into something which we all know, the informal sector. Obviously they were not employed in the formal sector. Informal sector which is once again a very significant um, backbone of uh, India's economy and of course Siddharth is here to sort of uh, maybe <coughs> vouch for that or maybe argue against but uh, mm, that they got drawn into uh, hugely into the informal sector and lives went on until 2020 when uh, not only Amphan happened but I was trying to also draw your attention to something else that 2020 in March there was this lockdown happened because of the pandemic, another disaster. <coughs> and lockdown happened <coughs> overnight and all these people soon got themselves thrown out of their employment um, overnight. And we all know uh, what happened to the migrant workers, how they came home, how they died, how they died from different instances of exhaustion, uh, got run over, and, and all stories that that's something that we are extremely and very, uh, I think, eloquently familiar with. Uh, the question that uh, I'm trying to now quickly pose before I conclude is that these people were living in a place which was not safe for them and therefore they had to leave. And they were in different cities of, of, of India where they were in employment and overnight they got thrown out, right? Meanwhile, between Isla and uh, Amphan, there was a huge discourse which uh, also informed the way in which Sundarban were to be shaped in the coming years. <laughs> this discourse was called the discourse of managed retreat, which was essentially the imagination of natural scientists, geographers, oceanographers, climatologists, environmentalists, who all kind of uh, came to sort of the conclusion that this is a place which is not suitable for humans because Isla happened and also 
that they were probably anticipating something like Amphan in 2020. And therefore, in 2016 and onwards, they uh, kind of, with WWF, came out with a policy of managed retreat, whereby they envisaged that by 2050, uh, they would have at least 1 million people from Sundarbans to be evacuated <coughs> to a separate place because in situ solutions to people's problem in Sundarbans is not possible. <coughs> and therefore, it is only by going out of the Sundarbans that some solution to people's problem could be found. Uh, of course, that they were all very uh, well meaning people and they were trying to understand the difficulties and the, and the problems that people faced living in Sundarbans. And therefore, they thought that this managed retreat would be the best way in which people could be guided out of the Sundarbans. As if you know, you are holding literally people's hand to take him out of Sundarbans to a safer place. And the question which then was also posed from certain other corners <coughs> as a kind of a counterpoint to this kind of a discourse was that was people's life, especially after 2020, safer in the cities as well? That the people went to the cities, lived in their cities, sometimes precariously in the informal sector, but eventually they, they had found their livelihood until a point when overnight the lockdown was announced and they got thrown out of the job. And they had all the harrowing experiences to share with. And most important, the people who had left Sundarban because of Aida and went places, they all started to come back to Sundarban because they thought that that was the only home that they left with, right? And that the home that they came, almost two months that they spent, and many of the people that we interviewed after I am fun about three weeks after Ampan, the many people who thought that the only place that they could think of was Sundarban. And they, and they almost took a month, two months, month and a half to reach Sundarban and before they could settle in May, the Ampan happened, right? But what they suggested was the life in the city was that they were living, it, the life that they were so familiar with suddenly turned as though it is completely unfamiliar overnight. Whereas, the Ampan that they actually encountered in the Sundarbans after they came was much too familiar because they have actually lived through several cyclones. They know exactly how cyclones happen and what cyclone actually left behind and how they actually built their life from the scratch every time a cyclone had struck their lives. So what I'm trying to suggest is that an imperative of development often, uh, often tries to sort of put you on a kind of a moral high ground as if you know everything about what people live and what people need. Uh, and that's what enables you to sort of envisage certain development models which need to be sort of looked at a little more carefully. Because this is the place which was originally settled by people not under their choices, but it was a settlement which, was, which, which happened and unfolded in the colonial time. And if it, if, it, if it almost, if it were almost, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, you, you kind of uh, take the clock back and, and sort of go to the original time when people settled in the Sundarbans and try to tell them that this is not a place where you should have settled. So it is the people who are living today must not pay the prices for the mistakes that their forebears paid. And if the development model continuously sort of articulates fear and in a manner in which that become paternalistic, you know, that the when I thought of communities as obstacles to development in the 1950-51, I was very paternalistic, right? That I thought that these are the communities which are seats of unreason, therefore they must go. When exactly 40 years <coughs> later, I considered them as seeds of tremendous wisdom and everything actually lies locked up there, I became also equally paternalistic. That I thought that it is only with taking few indigenous people with me that I'll be able to actually achieve development. Both, I think, seem inappropriate. And therefore, it is important that we must take a position where we must look into the way in which people negotiate their lives people live their lives, and under what circumstances they live their lives, and what knowledges are born out of such life. Because Sundarban is a place which often obfuscates our conventional wisdom, that we understand 
environment in terms of the land, water, and forest. And Sundarban is a place which is actually where land, water, and forest coalesce in ways in which they often leave the so-called policy developers, uh, policy makers, at their wit's end. And it is important that you must understand uh, what your wit allows you to do, right? Because if you do not do that, then you eventually take a moral high ground, <coughs> assuming what is absolutely necessary for people. And if you have to think of evacuating people from Sundarbans to a separate place, either in West Bengal or in Kolkata, I do not know, then you also have to think about those high stories which have already come up with the greater Kolkata wetlands. Because if tomorrow, some policy observers suggest that the, all those who have occupied, you know, wonderful coveted places in atmosphere or uh, what is that called, Arbana, then they might have to be evacuated to a separate place, you know, because Sundarban is not what it actually is in Sundarban. Sundarban extends far beyond that. And therefore, it is important that we must not take a moral high ground in, in either, you know, considering communities as enemies or as, you know, uh, almost unqualified uh, you know, celebrities of development. And you must understand where they are coming from. Thank you very much. Thank you, Avintesh. Please take your seat. And, uh, I will take just five minutes. Well, I had also given a paper with entitled Ethical Issues in Development with Dignity. Child development is inevitably linked with ethics. In our primary school, we were taught something known as moral science. And we were told what is morally right, what is morally wrong. I studied in English medium missionary schools, and so the question of morality was intimately tied up with theology. Today I will discuss very briefly Durkheim's concept of morality. Durkheim said that morality is linked to social needs and discipline is necessary to impose morality. A society without morality is a society where anomie prevails. Selfish people seldom behave morally. West Bengal is a prime example of the way selfish people have behaved. The education system has been virtually destroyed by selfish people. They have taken bribes for this appointment appointment to school as teachers and also as not teaching staff. And we know the result of this immoral behavior, which is which is actually a crime. Immoral behavior is also all immoral behavior is not crime. But this sort of immoral behavior is criminal behavior. And we know who are in the Pahela bias cells of presidency jail. So I will not mention their names. And as a result of this, the dignity of teachers has taken a beating. Teachers are one of the most honored people in the community. Why? Because they are in Indian culture, they are regarded not only as providers of knowledge or service providers, but as gurus. And that is why we celebrate Guru Purnima. But the dignity of teachers following this education scam has taken a beating. Teachers are no longer trusted. They are no longer trusted. If, a, if teachers 
If a teacher uh, uh, now applies for a loan from a bank, then the bank deliberately delays giving loan. First, they check the background of the teacher. The question uppermost in the mind of every banker is, is this teacher in the list of dismissal? Those who have been dismissed. So in this phase, Teacher, the dignity of teachers has taken a meeting and I think it will be a long time before it is restored. Thank you very much. And now we have a small, uh, small ceremony. But the first day I will thank Amitesh Mukherjee for... Thank you very much. We thank Amitesh Mukherjee for coming despite his ill health. And uh, this, is the, this is the memento of our seminar. And uh, I also thank Professor Mitro, the memento of the seminar, and Professor Mitra, please come and also share the stage with us. Madam, I'm going to go Thank you. 